So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of the Ehsas Women of Bangalore, Prabha Ketan Foundation, and the Taj West End. I welcome to you all of you to this first virtual session at uh, Kalam Bangalore with Mr. Salman Khurshid and Mr. Mujibir and Dr. Mujibir Rahman. As you're all aware, Salman Khurshid is an Indian politician, designated senior advocate, eminent author, and a law teacher. He was the cabinet minister of the Ministry of External Affairs. He belongs to the Indian National Congress. He is a lawyer and a writer who has been elected from the Farukabad Lok Sabha constituency in the general election of 2009. He started his political career in 1981 as an officer on special duty in the Prime Minister's office under the Prime Ministership of Indira Gandhi ji. Sri Khurshid has a passion for writing. His acclaimed play Sons of Babur has been translated into several languages and performed across the country as well as in the UK. At home in India, and if winter comes, Triple Talaq are among the better known books of the author. His new book, Visible Muslim, Invisible Citizens, is again another most loved one by book lovers. Thank you so much for joining, him, joining us today, Mr. Salman. With him in conversation is Dr. Mujibir Rahman, who is a professor at the Jamia Millia Islamia. He is educated at the University of Texas, Austin, USA, the University Heidelberg, Germany, and IIT New Delhi. Thank you so much. Before we start the first session and I hand over, let me remind all our viewers that we will be taking some questions from Mr. Salman to uh, answer at the end of the session. Please do raise your hand and type in your questions because we are all getting used to this virtual world. So I'm just explaining these uh, few things. Apart from that, just sit back and enjoy. We have a veritable treat coming virtually to you. All over to you, uh, Dr. Rahman and Sir Mr. Salman. Hi, uh, Salman. And thanks to the Khaitan Foundation for hosting it again. Uh, am I audible? Is that clear now? Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. yes. So I, I would like to start by congratulating Salman Saha for his book and uh, his book has generated considerable discussion on this contentious issue of uh, Indian politics, which is the place of Muslims in India and what future they hold. Uh, our conversation is going to be primarily based on or rather the content of this book, uh, his new book called Visible Muslim Invisible Citizen, Understanding Islam in Democracy, Indian Democracy, uh, published by Rupa a couple of months ago in the early part of 2019. Uh, but uh, uh, Salman Saha would probably comment on the contemporary political developments as well in the context of, of these formulations. So I would uh, first uh, uh, ask uh, Salman Saha to make some introductory remark on the, on the major formulations of the book. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, as a follow-up question, that ever since you wrote the book, a uh, number of important events have happened uh, which would remain uh, part of the narrative uh, of, of Muslim politics in India, uh, say Citizenship Act and, and Sahin Bagh, or, or the recent uh, Tablighi Jamaat uh, or Markaj incident, uh, which has been part of the conversation now. So I was wondering if you could uh, say, you know, say your introductory remark and then we will carry on the conversation after this. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, very much indeed, Professor Saab. Um, uh, good of you to find the time to, to talk to me uh, and welcome uh, people of Bangalore. I would have, uh, I would have really been happy to be there uh, in person, uh, but uh, this is now um, the way of the world and we have to go by it. Um, the way you introduced my, my book gives me, uh, gives me a sense uh, that I have, to make, uh, I have to make one thing very clear that thematically the book um, was talking about a phase uh, that one thought was inevitable with the emergence of uh, of a government and the emergence of, of a party uh, that was widely seen uh, not as being very sympathetic or, or very accommodative or what's a, what, what, what is called the, the minority sentiment. 
Um, in fact, uh, it, it was part of their campaign that minority appeasement is illegitimate. It is bad for democracy and it's bad for our country. Um, and their success would certainly have uh, registered a point that you can't continue arguing beyond an election. Uh, you have to then wait when an, another opportunity comes your way. And I assume that there would be a period in which there would be a kind of retreat and withdrawal. Uh, there were issues, and let me just tell you this, 30 years ago, I wrote a book uh, called At Home in India. And when I sat down 30 years later to write a book on, on, on the visible Muslim or the invisible citizen, is uh, a, a period in which nothing had changed. Some things had got bad, some things had got noticed, but nothing had changed. The problems all remain. And so I assumed that there would be a retreat and there would be a disappearance, which both as a strategy and as an objective, depending on which side you were on, uh, was becoming apparent. But curiously, from what you just mentioned, looking at what happened in the last few months, particularly the movement that's identified as the Scheinberg movement, uh, it just changed completely. People you assumed were going to be retreating into invisibility were certainly and suddenly asserting their identity and asserting, and asserting their participation in the democratic space. And I think that was, that was really a wonderful new development. Now, there are some, there's some downsides to it as well. Uh, what has happened with the markers, for instance, uh, what happened in the debate on the triple talaq, uh, many of these things, I do believe, have been misinterpreted, have been, mis, uh, have been wrongly projected. Um, but there could have been strategic mistakes. There could have been uh, a lack of capacity or lack of ability to explain the right perspective. And I think that will have to be factored in as this debate goes forward. But uh, curiously, my book, in a sense, has a little question mark now because the visibility factor is now being reversed and visibility is being asserted and that's a good thing for democracy. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> the visibility part, you know, uh, as, as, uh, as a scholars and commentators have commented, India has moved into an era of politics where politics of polarization has become the dominant strategy. And uh, so this visibility of Muslims have uh, both sides. It has the positive sides and it has the negative sides. And uh, in the negative side, uh, you know, that Muslims have also been targeted, lynchings and all these things have been about it. So I was wondering that would you just a little bit elaborate on that? Uh, you know, on the positive side, obviously they have come to the streets and asserted their democratic rights and all of that. And uh, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on this. Uh, well, yes, certainly, cert certainly, there is a very, there is a very uh, serious concern about the, the negativity that has come with the visibility. Um, perhaps if you, if you, if you really uh, put a fine point, uh, some of the negativity came even before the visibility. So it wasn't that the negativity was in reaction to visibility. Um, it was negativity per se, which was there. The part of part of the political uh, political uh, changes that were being experienced by the country, but um, it would have been worse if there was no visibility. The visibility is important, and it's happened. And this visibility is not an exclusive visibility. Uh, when people came out in Jamia or in in uh, your university and in Shinebag and and hundreds of places across the country, they were not just women alone, and not just Muslim women alone. They were, they were university students cutting across religions, cutting across communities, cutting across languages, etc., who were participating, giving a new metaphor for freedom. Now, of course, some people get very upset uh, when in free India someone speaks of freedom. And there's a debate about why do you need freedom when we got freedom in 1947. But yes. then, I mean, that's, that's a puerile debate, frankly. It's a very puerile debate if you don't understand what freedom and liberty mean. But there is this very worrisome dimension, and I, I agree as, you, as you, you flagged it, a very worrisome dimension which is coming from 
polarization. I sincerely hope, and I'm, I, I, I may be completely wrong, but uh, having known, having known uh, attempts by opponents when one goes to fight elections to polarize and divide people along caste lines or community lines or religious lines, uh, my experience has been that, that people are remarkable that they do not allow it to happen. Um, and I hope that that will ultimately is, be the case in our country. It must be the case in our country that people will not allow polarization to be a permanent thing. It may be a passing feature of, of a particular moment, but that it will not happen in a permanent way to cause damage to this beautiful country of ours and this beautiful society of ours. Uh, so, now, sir, in the discussion on Muslim politics, there are two issues or two factors which are often uh, often uh, occupy the central place. Uh, and in your uh, in your book, also you have addressed them. One is the partition partition of India, and one of the interesting aspect, and in fact, a very original interpretation that I found in your analysis of the book, that uh, that there is this whole argument that that what happened in 1947, the partition and the creation of Pakistan is a unique event and there are different sides to it, to that debate. But uh, you have taken it further. You have this analysis of looking at partition as partition one and then creation of Bangladesh as partition two. And then you bring in the state reorganization commission and how the governance structure of India has been constantly uh, reorganized in order to meet the new challenges. So in other words, uh, what you are, in my understanding, what you were suggesting perhaps was this, that in a manner that we physically, uh, the political structure was imagined during the anti-colonial movement, there were concerns by different stakeholders or different participants and constituencies. And uh, partisan was one option for some people and was not an option for some other people. But the fact is that that, that, that particular imagination of political structure was not adequate and that is uh, you know, corroborated by the fact that, that we have the state reorganization commissions and all of that. They are of different kinds of reorganization and partisan is an extreme version of it. Uh, so so uh, is that what you really meant and could it be possible for you to elaborate? Because if one looks at it from, from your point of view, I think this whole anger and there is this uh, argument of Muslim betrayal and all of that, uh, which is associated with this and has led to a lot of bad feelings and is probably one of the key factor behind the rise of Hindu fundamentalism or Hindu nationalism or, or, or Muslim hate campaign uh, could probably be moderated uh, or diluted. Well, that's an interesting, you, you put an interesting, interesting structure on, on this. Um, Let's look at what's happened in, in India in terms of restructuring of states. Uh, look at UP and Uttarakhand. Uh, look at Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, look at uh, Punjab, Punjab and, and Haryana. Uh, look at Bihar, Bihar and, and, and Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. Uh, has there been a continuing hostility, bitterness, anger? Uh, in any of these places, they haven't been. Uh, people have fought very, very vigorously and, and sometimes very, um, in a very cruel manner uh, to, to uh, bifurcate their states uh, or trifurcate their states, as the case may be. Uh, but once they've got their state, they've moved on and they've cooperated and they've been good neighbors and good friends. The bitterness has been has been forgotten and forgiven. Um, and the, the, the continuing debate about you wronged us, et cetera, has gone. Obviously, there were concerns about, about parts of the previous states not getting a just and a fair distribution of opportunity. But why is it that when this happens within the country, it, you can move on, but when it happens with the country, you can't move on. We haven't moved on and Pakistan hasn't moved on. Bangladesh, of course, is, is obviously very, very, very different. And in Bangladesh, in the birth of Bangladesh, India has this enormous contribution and, and some great sacrifices. Um, sadly, that the, the bonding that we should have with Bangladesh uh, 
uh, sometimes gets gets stressed a little bit, uh, and I think partly to do partly to do with the, uh, the the new structure of citizenship in our country, but the bitterness survives and and has survived, and it's obviously helped political political platforms on both sides of the of the border. Um, they've helped helped people in Pakistan. Uh, they've helped people people in India, uh, and if not. In the past, they've continue, they continue to help India now, uh, at this point, elections where suddenly foreign policy, which means nothing in our elections, becomes important vis-a-vis Pakistan in our elections. Um, why this, is, this happens, I think it's, it's a little difficult to tell. But I can certainly say that I once in Pakistan did say to them at an, at an NGO gathering that you continue to talk about talk about um, unfinished agenda of the partition, but you would do a great disservice to a large number of Muslims living in India who want to live as faithful Indian citizens and participate in the growth of this country. You, by doing the things that you do, create problems for them. So for God's sake, for God's sake, look after your own country. Forget about us. Forget about Jammu and Kashmir. But the tragic thing is that they don't. They continue to needle us. And uh, the price, sadly, is being paid by the very people who paid the price of partition without wanting partition, who stayed on in India as true citizens of our country, and are continuing to have to pay for that again and again, again and again in every generation. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you know, uh, I would like to just further uh, this particular conversation uh, around the question of Pakistan. Uh, you know, there is this whole rhetoric of go to Pakistan, uh, which is constantly thrown at Muslims. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, one basic distinction that you are trying to make in your book in terms of visibility of Muslims is essentially the ability of Muslims to assert their democratic rights as equal citizens. And uh, that's one way that one could look at it in my view. Uh, but that does not mean that Muslims are not visible uh, in the sense that, that you know, you have this Khan Brothers dominant Bollywood movie. And, uh, you know, so they are quite visible in all theaters and everywhere about it. So, uh, you know, uh, and the Pakistan question, you have this very interesting take. Uh, you, you know, you write uh, in your book that uh, the imagination that caused the rupture between India and Pakistan is the very imagination that can create a new reality that uh, that would assume prosperity and 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 the context uh, content uh, and, and bring peace to both sides, uh, you know. Um, so you have this argument that that we need to have a new imagination, uh, a new sense of normality between these two nations. Uh, and uh, I was wondering whether you'd like to elaborate on that. Uh, and and, at, and, at, and subsequently you say that that you know a successful Pakistan is good for India, and a successful India is good for Pakistan. So I was wondering if you could just uh, unravel uh, uh, this, this notion. But certainly, it seems like a pipe dream. Uh, it seems like a, uh, it's like a wild imagination. But um, frankly, if you look at it carefully, what other, what other option do we have as neighbors? Um, as people say, you, you uh, cannot choose your neighbors. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your neighbors. Now, if we are to be neighbors, uh, should we not uh, be neighbors who are friendly? Uh, why should we be at each other's throats all the time? Uh, the amount of, of, uh, uh, of development that we uh, give a go-by to because we have to spend money on, on armaments and the amount of development they have completely neglected because of their, uh, their uh, military uh, industrial industrial sector um, but how will this ever happen i mean it's happened in germany it's happened uh, in a very bitterly divided divided germany and a very very uh, g- dangerously guarded wall between east and west germany but that disappeared uh, a long civil war fought between north and south vietnam that disappeared uh, we, we hear periodically about the possibility of, of at least some detente or some arrangement happening between North and South Africa, uh, not North and South, South Korea. Uh, they, they don't have, they don't have uh, a complete arrangement, but they st- have uh, South Korean 
industrial establishment across the across the no man's land into north north korea and that suggests that there would be something something in the future now if people can do that the world over why can't we do it here in our neighborhood is the big question now some people will get upset uh, even at my suggesting that we should we should be better off as friends but the issue is not saying that we should be better off as friends is doesn't mean that you are saying that the other person has done no wrong that's not the issue but you have to go beyond that you have to go beyond and do what what nelson mandela did in south africa is to say that there is time for reconciliation but what precedes reconciliation is the truth but the truth is not for purposes necessarily of uh, pinning down people and punishing them and so on and so forth um, although there is some accountability obviously but then you move on now i personally think that that in the world of tomorrow in the world of today as we sit here fighting coronavirus and the world has suddenly collapsed into one small unit uh, can we continue to think of our neighbors as being our permanent enemies can we continue to give up the advantages there would be of cooperation but of course of course when i see this one expects uh, somebody on the other side to be to be uh, responsive somebody on the other side to have the capacity if if not the intention the capacity at least and then develop an intention to respond to something of this nature uh you know in the discussion on muslim politics you know uh, increasingly there is a voice that is coming out which is saying that the muslim problems are internal you know it is the community has its own problem which is the reason why the community is backward and uh, so uh, you know what would be your take on that you know when i wrote the review of your book i i i had a reflection on this and i i'd like to know what, what do you think about it well you see i i, I remember that um it's a very complicated complicated uh position really um should we look at comparable situations elsewhere in the world i mean look at uh look at uh look at the black community in the united states look at the jewish community in the united states um uh, we look at our home uh near a home in india we look at the sikh community went through a traumatic experience in in addition for and how they quickly picked themselves up from that traumatic experience both within punjab and outside punjab wherever they were um and they moved on they moved on of course they got they got acknowledgement uh, at every step uh, they got remorse and regret at every step but they moved on and they're back at the top as they always have been now we have made enormous enormous contributions in certain fields and you've just mentioned the khan brothers for instance i mean we're talking of bollywood what would bollywood do without without the muslim faces etc whether women or or men music for instance classical music modern music um, there are remarkable things in this field of sports and cricket and hockey uh, there are remarkable things but when you get into when you get into public life there are problems uh, when you get into in, into uh, the sphere of of public discourse there are there are problems um now how does how does that happen there's a model in which we said let the muslims of india be represented by majority leaders who are sensitive to them and who understand them nehru and indira gandhi and rajiv gandhi were all leaders of the indian minorities mulayam singh yadav a leader of indian minority lalu yadav a leader of indian muslims etc is how it was seen but you reach a point when you when you discover that it's not working out i mean it's it's ending up with with the uh, the muslim minority just adding to the clout of somebody else but not getting anything in return and as a result when you see parliament today and you see in public life today there isn't space for leadership from the muslim community i would still continue to believe that people from the majority community should take special responsibility to represent muslims and muslims to reach out to them i wish that would happen it's an ideal situation but if that were to happen 
then going looking for Muslim leaders, as it were, would not happen. And why should a Muslim be called a Muslim leader alone? Why can't the Muslim be a leader of Indian people, just as a non-Muslim leader is a leader of Indian people, but people like Bahugna and Mulayam Singh Yadav and Indira, Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi have been seen as being having special, uh, special um, connect with Muslims and uh, having their faith and having, having their confidence. And I, I wish that that would continue. But unfortunately, that seems to be withering away for the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since you mentioned about the race question, one of the dimensions of this particular discussion is the relationship between Muslim elites and Muslim masses. Uh, you know, there is an argument that Muslim elites are reluctant to, 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 to support uh, Muslim masses. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, you know, recently this race question has become quite prominent in the context of coronavirus in America. Now, President Obama came out with a statement that why it has affected black community, uh, you know, more than it has affected white community. And he was not hesitant about it. Uh, he was upfront. He said that, that, you know, these are the reasons because of the health history and all of that, that black community is more affected. But you don't come across that in case of Muslim elites, you know. You are right that there are a lot of Muslims who are out there in different walks of life and have set a very high standard. Uh, you know, excelled in the face of adverse circumstances, obviously because of the secular India, not that, that, that they excel just because they happen to be Muslims, but we have a secular political culture in which, uh, in which people excel. So, but they don't come up uh, and, and take a position uh, when, when uh, ordinary Muslims face discrimination. You know, you are an exception uh, and you are in a public life, but a lot of issues which have got uh, direct, uh, you know, uh, implication with respect to the uh, social relationships and our social fabric at this point of time is argued to facing uh, unprecedented strain. Uh, so, so what did you say to that? that? Right, I, I, I think this is a very, very deep question, very deep question. Uh, President Obama, uh, I, like, I like him. I mean, I think he's a wonderful example of what modern leadership should be. Um, President Obama can speak on blacks with greater confidence mm -hmm. and, and, and greater uh, 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 forthrightness, then he would speak about Muslims. Uh, um, he had a Muslim middle name, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But he, would, he wouldn't want to speak about Muslims in this, with the same, same uh, assertiveness as he does for the blacks. Similarly in our country, any one of us, any one of us from whatever religion, any one of us would have no problem speaking up for Dalits, for speaking up for Ambedkar and Dalits and the Dalit movement and, and, and for people uh, within the Dalit movement who have been, uh, who've been harangued by, uh, by recent uh, political groups, etc. Um, there, there, is, there, is, there is no uh, automatic imposition of a question on put on you. The moment you speak, the moment you speak for a Muslim cause, uh, you're questioned for being communal. Uh, you're questioned for being uh, anti-progressive. You're questioned for being uh, regressive. And therefore, I understand people become careful. People say, let's be a little bit diplomatic. Strategically, let's avoid this. Let's take up uh, the point that you just, just mentioned earlier. Uh, what happened with the Tablighi Jamaat and the markers in, in Nizamuddin. Now, a lot of people said, why don't you speak up? Why don't all of you speak up? Why don't Muslims come out categorically against the Tablighi Jamaat? Now, there is one thing that has gone wrong recently in the, in the markers by the congregation that happened. Although you can find legal explanations that they were legally not in the wrong, but certainly it seemed an indiscretion in times when there was talk of corona and there was talk of social distancing all over. But if they've made one mistake and if they are legally wrong, like anybody else who must be answerable for a legal wrong, they must be answerable. But they can't be a hundred years of uh, hundred years of their uh, uh, of their work, whether you're part of it, whether you like it or you don't like it. Hundred years of their work cannot suddenly be put under a question mark. But if you don't, 
then you are put and if you do do question it and if you don't question it you are you are put under a question mark now that's a horrible and a terrible thing to happen in a democracy not everybody is belongs to the tablighi jamaat not everybody has time for them not everybody is sympathetic to them people may belong to other other islamic groups somebody once asked me recently in a week ago came to me and said why does the tablighi jamaat had to have its headquarters in india why are they not in in saudi arabia and i said because it was started by an indian indian imam and it was started in india that's why the headquarters are in india why should they be somewhere else if the man was from india but you can see how the mind was working that these are not our own these are aliens and these are aliens who are now hurting us they are creating a problem for us so you must come out categorically against them now coming against categorically against somebody who's done an indiscre indiscretion but not necessarily a legal wrong and certainly by coming uh, by saying something about them you can't run down 100 years of their own work these are the kind of problems that we are running in and therefore to answer your question when a muslim elite leader as it were if that's the best expression that's available is careful with his words about about ordinary indians uh, who are muslims he does this because of a self consciousness that has been imposed upon him and therefore it needed um, someone like justice sachar or someone like justice uh, uh, justice mishra to come out with reports to say there is something terribly wrong economically socially educationally and we need to fix it and the sachar committee report then i believe was the brilliant brilliant exposition of what participatory democracy requires and yet the self consciousness made many of us careful about speaking up for the sachar committee and how sad a thing it's happened in india that we missed the great opportunity of putting our democracy on a higher level if we had been able to implement sachar effectively mm -hmm. yeah uh, you know in your uh, in your analysis you basically suggesting that 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 uh, there are uh, this obvious challenge which is that you are going to be called a name or there are all these backlashes which pushes all these elites not to take a firm position but uh, you know historically if you look at nehru and gandhi and all these people in those content in those difficult times were also called names you know they also faced enormous amount of criticism but they still remain very firm uh, in taking a stand it's not just of muslims uh, you know uh, you know you look at new zealand prime minister the sort of positions he took with respect to muslims and and the attack and all of that you don't come across secular leaders in this country coming from majority community taking such a position these days which could come anywhere close to close to nehru's position while confronting fundamentalism from the majority side uh, do you see that a problem because i recall you gave an interview a couple of years ago where you said uh, after demolition of babri masjid uh, you know even in my party there were leaders who used to say oh this is not the right time to talk about secularism you know let's let's be guarded on this because there is this uh, whole thing has come up uh because of this hindu consciousness and all of that stuff about of it uh so i, I was wondering uh, you, you know in this context uh, what is your analysis where does this whole crisis in secularism is leading to and how to revive it because we don't have we have just four five minutes so i thought you know we can conclude with this you want you, you want to revive secularism in four minutes <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs> anyway i I'll, i'll only i only say i only say this that this is i believe uh, the the greatest challenge of our times the greatest challenge of our times now when i talk to people about the judgment of the supreme court on on ayodhya i tell them that there are there are some amazing findings in that judgment that should actually point to uh, to our faith in the supreme court as trying to keep this society together but if you just don't read the judgment and say well did we get the mosque there or we didn't get the mosque there then in that case uh, you don't get very far but i think there are some some very very important important factors in that judgment that point to the true secular character of our society and it's not only about about where the mosque will be built and 
certainly it's important that having decided in the manner that they decided, they also said that some reparation need to be done to Muslims, which is give them a mosque nearby, not the same land, but within those 60 acres, 60 acres, or somewhere within the city. Now, if that happens, I think that you're back to, back to a win-win situation, at least to an extent. Now, this needs to be done what the Supreme Court tried to do, and the Supreme Court has to work within a very limited, very limited uh, uh, kind of window. Uh, this has to be done by people in politics. Uh, mm. And I, I agree, We've, uh, we have a problem. To this day, we have a problem, and I've often described it as strategically, you can do something that works because you are up against a very, very virulent enemy uh, or a virulent competition. But at the same time, ideologically, you must not dilute your position. It is important that we keep our ideological position on participatory democracy for minorities and for minorities not to be seen as an exception, but minorities to be seen as part of a whole where they need to be fortified and strengthened. Uh, and I think this is the challenge of our times and the emergence of the politics of tomorrow will have, I am quite certain, something to do with this. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the closing question, can I ask a question question or should we go for the Q&A? Anindita? Hello. Yeah, I doctor, let you ask. can I ask one more question? Can I ask one question more? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the last question. Uh, this is concerning the role of media. You have this interesting narrative about your own experience in your book, uh, how things get distorted. And uh, in the context of coronavirus, uh, you know, there are very powerful section of media are also painting it. Uh, you know, there is this whole argument that communalization is going on coronavirus might end, but Islamophobia would remain in this country. So what's your take on this? So to what extent media is responsible in, 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 in advancing this politics of polarization? Well, I, you know, obviously you need to study the Indian media to work things out there. It's a lot to do with finances. It's a lot to do with, with uh, uh, cross fertilization um, in, terms of, in terms of funding, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, industry, um, a lot of those things. Uh, there are big problems. There are big problems with the independence of media in our country. Uh, but um, that's a larger issue. That, that issue will have to be controlled when, when there is a liberal government in this country. But while the media remains what it is, what it is, or at least part of the media remains what it is, uh, we haven't strategized enough, I think. I think collectively we had to strategize to take them on. We haven't been able to do it. If Shaheen Bagh can happen without leaders, if Jamia students can come out without leaders, you don't even have a students' union, they can come out without leaders. If uh, women of Lucknow can come out at the Ghantaghar without any, any leaders, I still can't figure out any names who could be described as leaders of those movements. Why could we have not done something similar to counter the media campaign in this country, which is fouling up? the pristine democracy of, of our land. Um, so I think there's something that could have been done and something that, that should be done. So now I think the, the, the event, this discussion is open to questions uh, from the participants. Uh, shall I ask? Uh, uh, yes, uh, send me the question. Is the, yeah, Sruti? Yeah. Uh, we start with uh, Mr. Munif Khan from Indian Express. The first question will be asked by him. Mm -hmm. Can we have Mr. Munif Ka Khan's audio on, please? Hello. Hello. Yes, Mr. Munif, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, Mr. Goshen. Uh, firstly, I'd like to open. Uh, firstly, I'd like to open with how are you spending your time amidst this quarantine? Given that it is a self-imposed quarantine now to start off. <laughs> sure, it's not. It's not easy for someone like me, frankly, because we are on the move all the time. 
but I've uh, uh, I've finished uh, writing a, a book on on the Citizens Amendment Act, uh, which has gone to the publisher for typesetting yesterday, and I'm now working on a book on the Ayodhya. So I've uh, uh, this is really God given. I mean, it's a great opportunity. I would never have done these books if I if I hadn't got into a lockdown. That sounds lovely. And um, Mr. Krishit, coming to the question of again. Uh, the Tablighi Jamaat bro, which, which, is, you know, which did occupy a lot of space on news over the, over the few weeks. Uh, do you feel personally that when it comes to the you know, when it narrative which was pushed on by the media, uh, do you feel a lot of it has an underlying layer of, you know, see this is a virus which I, then again cannot be communalized. Everybody knows the origin of the virus. Everybody knows that it is a man-made pandemic more ever. And uh, coming to the question of how the Tablighi role was done, do you feel that there is this layer in India where when it comes to anything which is on the lines of religion, for some reason that has to be politicized bigger than the matter that already is? Because this is a humanitarian issue and not a religious issue. Well, I think it's, it's certainly true. The only problem is that, that social distancing is not, not uh, useful when it comes to the, uh, the problem, problem of communal virus. Uh, social distancing <laughs> is perhaps the worst thing that you can do. Uh, you need to be there, you need to confront, you need to engage, you need to connect, etc. Uh, it's only then that you would be able to defeat that, that, uh, that uh, virus. Uh, but you know, the important thing really is, uh, and this is, not, this is not where the media uh, was uh, directly responsible, but I think the government should have been a little more careful because they they were for one reason or another uh, they were in a position to test more people who were coming out of the uh, public jamaat congregation oh. and therefore the figures that came out of there were distorted figures they were figures that would misrepresent and give a wrong impression if you had done the same thing elsewhere you might not have had that same impression of a runaway uh, runaway spreader etc uh, but Anyway, this is something that will pass. Um, what we need to do now really is, is to engage the media uh, in, uh, in, in dealing with, with this whole problem of homophobia. And you'll need some good storytellers and good communicators to do this. I think this is the project for the future after we get out of, of the lockdown. This is what we need to do. Um, when, when, I, when I say we, I believe all liberal people in the country will have to do this. And they are not a few. There are many liberal people in this country and therefore we shouldn't lose heart. All right, all right. And so uh, today the Prime Minister announced an extension of the lockdown, which is again, uh, this was obvious for, for various reasons. And when it comes to the question, my question lies more on the lines of economy. For an economy of our country, which has already taken a very huge beating, and again, this lockdown, this lockdown comes and puts more nails in the coffin. Do you feel that uh, an extended lockdown, but, but then again, there are no sort of concrete plans on how to, how to recover the losses and how to you know, uh, implement smarter initiatives? How does it look even when this lockdown opens after a certain point? Well, I, uh, I think the extension itself and beyond the extension, if we are in a position to, to lift as uh, we will need to at some point of time, uh, these are, it's the cost benefit analysis, one against the other, uh, but to keep the economy, economy going and, and to keep, uh, keep the vulnerable, vulnerable people in their lives intact are very big challenges. And you can't wait for another 15 days to do it. We need to do it today. I think there should be much greater information available, communications, uh, much better communications about uh, outreach towards the vulnerable people. Governments are doing something, NGOs are doing something, but how much is the coverage and where are the slippages, et cetera, we need to be able to know. We shouldn't have to go to the Supreme Court to say, you please get us this information. And governments should make this information available on their own. Thank you so we much, also, Manif. We move uh, on to the question. next uh, I'll have just one final question, actually. And uh, this is a question, again, which comes in the lines of what you've been writing recently. And uh, see, Mr. Kushan, you were uh, a defense lawyer for the student Islamic movement of India back in 2002. And as a person who has been very vocal and um, very, very vocal against atrocities which happen wide, wide over the world, do you feel right now that the common Muslim across the globe is a bigger victim of Islamophobia when compared to the last 30 years? 
Well, I, these things happen. I mean, I've, uh, I, I don't sit down and compare how things were 10 years ago and how things are now. Uh, I see a lot more of it now around me. Uh, I've, I've, seen, I've seen some of this uh, in the demolition time of Babri Masjid, et cetera, uh, and when the Bombay riots happened. So once been through that, uh, but really, I guess comparisons are odious, if ever they are. Uh, they are odious in how bad things are in terms of Islamophobia. Uh, I still have faith and confidence that this country is not going to give in to Islamophobia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. The next question we have will be from N. Junaid. Please, can we have the audio on for Naomi Junaid? Naomi, please proceed. Uh, good evening, Mr. Khurshid. What an honor. I'd like to thank Kalam for this opportunity. Mr. Khurshid, I'm a Muslim and I'd like to put this question forward to you about what the way forward for liberal and practicing Muslims is. In my interaction recently with a lot of people that I would have previously considered right-wing and polarized, I've had an opportunity to read their posts, to understand them better. And something stood out. Like I attended the book reading of Vikram Sampath. He's, he wrote a book on Veer Savarkar. And what I realized was this, there was this uh, brooding uh, dislike for the rule of the Mughals, for having been subjugated to Muslim rule for over many centuries. And uh, a young, very hardworking, very bright MP from South Bangalore had recently tweeted something to the extent of saying that if we don't vote BJP, we're going to have Mughal rule back. So what I, what I understand is that there's a fear of a Muslim takeover, which is unfounded. But, I, but most people think it's a possibility or they fear it. How can we be proactive about this? We as Muslims. I understand. I understand. Uh, um... There is, a, <laughs> there is a mischievous, brighter side. I mean, our GDP was very good in the Mughal times. Um, so if we're all after GDP, that's how to get it. Um, but but listen, they feel a humiliation for a rule. I know, I see, that, I see the point. We are in a democracy now. And in a democracy, in a democracy, there are many, many problems. Democracy is not perfection. Democracy is the best that we know about uh, running our, our lives. There cannot be something better than a democracy. But democracy has certain deficits. Democracy has certain flaws. And those flaws happen because of our misusing democracy. And what people are doing is that they are misusing democracy. I mean, you and I could argue that uh, we, have, we have a problem with what happened with Adam and Eve. Uh, we have a problem with that, but it won't get us anywhere. If we can persuade people to follow some, some tale of that kind, uh, we may get ourselves opportunities and power, but that's not going to solve the problems of humanity. And I think what we need to do is, we should not be self-conscious. Liberals in India, and liberals includes Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, liberals in India must not be self-conscious that there is a stronger narrative against us. I think all we need to do is to learn to tell the liberal narrative. It can be extremely, extremely powerful. There's no reason for us to feel that we cannot and will not be able to answer this, the narrative that's been given to us. But yes, it will take the right kind of people. And uh, I hope the right people are prepared to jump into public life and public discourse and give us, give us a more satisfactory situation. Thank Mr. Khurshid, one more question, may I? Yes, please. Sir, don't you think the, the, the whole Tablighi Markaz issue calls for a more inclusive society? If any, I think it's the strongest argument I see for a more inclusive society. Because uh, through the, you know, the, the speeches that went viral, you can notice a distrust for the government. You know? I don't know if it's official, if it was verified, but they bear audios doing the rounds that you don't listen to the government. And as you can see, you, that played out. Let me just tell you something very interesting. Let me tell you something very interesting. Um, they've, they, have, they have a very different, uh, very different method of operating. 
And uh, part of their method of operating is to keep very close contacts with the government. And uh, if they've been able to do all that they've been able to do, even when ordinary people may have had difficulty in getting permissions and so on, they have got permissions. It's just that when things went out of hand, that obviously their government contacts decided that, look, let's have our hands off. Let's not uh, take any flack for these people. Why should we take flack for these people? But their problem may well be that they are not, they are not adequately connected with the outside world. Uh, and they didn't realize that the insider dealings are now over. A lot of the dealings now you have to do in the world out in the open, because out in the open is the media, there's public discourse, there's social media. And I think that they are just a little bit, a little bit backward in, in catching up on what's happening with the changing media world. And that's probably what cost them their... Uh, the, the Mr. Kushit, in fact, I don't think they're even in touch with their scriptures because Islam has clear directives to quarantine in, in cases of a plague. I, know, I, 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 I do know that. I didn't, I didn't want to get into, a, I didn't want to get into yes. a religious dispute with them. That's the only reason. I mean, they have, they have, uh, they have certain views. I, I, I believe they can have their views, but uh, they would do well to come and talk to other people who may have different views. Thank you, sir. We move on to our last question for this evening. Can I please request Shaista to ask her question? Can we unmute Shaista, please? Shaista, yeah. Shaista, please, may we have you ask your question? No, I don't have any questions. Oh, sorry. I thought you raised your hand. We got a symbol that you raised your hand. Okay, so that I think uh, brings us to the end of this very, very engrossing uh, evening and session we've had with you. So we sincerely hope that we see a more in ex inclusive uh, country moving forward. And the writings that you have written during this uh, lockdown period definitely are something we're looking forward to coming back from the publisher and being in our hands soon. So we're going to wait for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahman, for making this a very, very uh, intriguing and giving us a lot of food for thought through this conversation. A lot of us are going to be reading up a lot of on all these uh, topics that have been discussed and have a more broader perspective, I hope. Thank you well, so you'll much. Probably Thank have, you, you'll probably have a book from, from Dr. Mujibur Rahman in the future where I could ask him questions about his Brilliant. Book. We're waiting for that too soon, soon, sir. Thank you so much. Thank That's you, Dr. Sure. Rahman. Thank you so much, uh, Kulshid, sir. Okay. And thank you so much to all our audience for being with us this uh, evening. And on behalf of the SAS Women of Bangalore, that's Babita Katutia, Sureka Prelad, and me, Shruti Mittal, we sign off from this session. Looking forward to more sessions with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best. Thank Good you. All the best. Good afternoon.